Thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. I appreciate that you are evincing some interest in lymphatic disease and lymphedema, which is a topic that interests me quite a lot. As you can see from my title slide, I am by training a cardiologist. I continue to practice cardiology, but for the last 10 to 15 years, I've been very interested in the problems of the lymphatic circulation and the diseases that can ensue and I spend a lot of my time advocating on behalf of patients who have lymphatic disease. So I'm hoping to share some of that interest with you this evening and help you understand a little bit of the struggle that we have to find better answers for uh, these disease states. Well, I'm going to suspect that many of the people in the room either have lymphedema or know somebody that has lymphedema, which is the reason you might be here tonight. And if so, you probably know more about lymphedema than some of the healthcare professionals that you might have consulted with in the past because this picture, I, in my mind, illustrates really what doctors have done to receive patients with lymphedema, certainly over the last 50 years and proceeding right into the present. If they are knowledgeable about the lymphatic system, they know that the disease states that exist are numerous and very important. Lymphedema perhaps is the most common of them, but there are certainly many. And the insightful clinicians will know that knowing something about the lymphatic system or learning more about the lymphatic system will actually bring answers to a broad array of diseases that historically nobody would have said uh, are specifically lymphatic, but we now understand that there are lymphatic implications, certainly to cancer and its rate of spread and its roots of spread, to a variety of autoimmune diseases and arthritis, chronic infections, inflammation. There is an impact on transplantation biology, which touches my life as a cardiologist as well. Certainly the mainstream cardiac diseases, coronary disease, heart failure, and a lot of metabolic disorders as well. Well, why is it that your doctors perhaps don't know very much about lymphedema? About four or five years ago, I was invited to give a symposium at the Association of American Medical Colleges, the group that pretty much oversees the curriculum of medicine in the United States. And we, in preparation for that symposium, we wanted to learn something about the extent to which the lymphatic system is studied today, or five years ago, let's say, in the American healthcare environment. And we actually surveyed the chiefs of the departments in the 110 schools in the US and Canada and got about a 75% response rate. And here you see the data that we were able to accumulate. As you'll notice, the vast preponderance of people who receive a medical degree in the United States or Canada here during a four-year medical education about the lymphatic system for under an hour, and many for less than 15 minutes. So it shouldn't surprise you then that your doctors may not be adequately prepared to deal with these diseases. Most physicians today think the lymphatics equal lymph nodes, and lymph nodes equal structures to be biopsied by surgeons to determine if there's been cancer spread, and that kind of ends it. But it turns out uh, if I'm going to talk to you a little bit about lymphedema, I first have to tell you just a little bit about the lymphatic system. And we're going to spend more than 15 minutes, so you're going to be much better educated than your doctors by the time you walk out of here. The lymphatic system is part of the circulation, and it exists for a number of reasons, but in terms of fluid balance, it exists because about 1% of the blood that circulates through your body with every passage is left behind in the tissues and has to find some route back to the heart. And that route, in fact, is the lymphatic system. 
The lymphatic system also has very important immune functions. So you'll find that these small vessels, and we've depicted them schematically on this, on this uh, uh, pictorial representation, are distributed most heavily in the areas of the body that come in contact with the outside world. So on the outside, of course, we have the skin, and the skin is replete with lymphatic vessels, but also in the gastrointestinal tract, in the lung, these are two other areas where the outside world comes in direct contact, and our bodies need to be able to defend us from outside invaders and use the lymphatic system. So in health, not only do the, do the lymphatics drain fluid, but they also help us to absorb fats from the intestine. They help us to maintain that fluid balance that we require, returning that 1% of fluid back to the central circulation and helping us in our, the ability of our immune system to fight off disease by bringing the disease-fighting cells to the part of the body that is to be defended. So I'd say we've made a little bit of progress in the last few years. I think a few more physicians know about lymphedema. Now they sort of remember it as something they don't know anything about as opposed to not even recognizing the name. But uh, I think we're making a little bit of progress and I'm gonna spend the rest of this evening talking primarily about lymphedema, what we know about it, and what we hope to know in the future. Those people who have had some education in lymphedema um, have traditionally thought of lymphedema as either primary or secondary. So that means a condition that causes swelling in part or parts of the body based on inadequate lymphatic function that you're either predestined to have because of your genetics, that would be the primary form, or something that happens to you in life that damages your lymphatic system and makes it incompetent. It turns out that the division is not so exact, but for tonight's purposes, we'll, we'll leave it at that, but recognize that there is a broad area of interface where these conditions are not so clearly one or the other. As we get a little more sophisticated in our discussion, we can talk about the very many causes, both on the primary side and on the secondary side, that can cause this problem. So here's an example of primary lymphedema. This happens to be a condition called Milroy's disease, described by a physician in New York at the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, representing this condition that runs in families. Roughly half of the individuals in an affected family will have this. The child is born with the lymphedema and it persists throughout life. As you can see in this case, it can be asymmetric. So in this individual, only one of the two lower legs is affected. Here's an even less common uh, so-called primary form or inherited form. This has a very um, tongue-twisting Latin name called lymphedema dystichiasis. But what all that means is that the lymphedema exists in the same patient that happens to have uh, a double row of eyelashes, and in Latin that term is dystichiasis. So the same gene that causes the lymphedema also causes this mild uh, defect in the development of the eye. This kind of lymphedema, again, is determined by a gene that's present at birth, but the lymphedema does not actually appear until uh, typically puberty or even later. Now, if you look throughout the world, the most common cause of lymphedema that you'll come up with uh, is actually a tropical infectious disease. Um, this disease is called filariasis, and basically you acquire this disease because there is an obligate vector, in this case a mosquito, that is itself infected with a microscopic worm or nematode, and when this infected mosquito bites an uninfected individual or draws blood from the individual, it leaves behind the worm, which then multiplies in the host's body and eventually destroys the lymphatic system, leading to a very severe form of lymphedema that is sometimes called elephantiasis. We typically see this in third world countries, um, typically, most typically in Asia and Africa, but in, in uh, the Americas, we do see pockets of filariasis typically in Haiti and also in Brazil. Those are the two most commonly affected areas. It would be rare to impossible to imagine that an American uh, individual having not left the borders of this country could ever have filariasis. It could be acquired in international travel, but even that is, is, is very unlikely. Um, the common 